culmination of the NASA project that is about to end in August, which led to the development of the ENV data interface in MoveBank and got us to talk to many scientists and try to really expand the scope at which movement analysis is done and the type of data that movement analysis is based on and trying to kind of make environmental data easily available to everyone, make sure that no technical limitations are stopping biologists from reaching the exciting conclusions that they can. So I'll use some of my presentation to show you what we have, what we can do, and then at the end, kind of one study that highlights some of conclusions, which are the type of things that you can study now very easy with a click of a button. So this is the movie that started it all. This is not how it started. It started in a very ugly kind of R rudimentary, I'm a geek and read the matrix kind of thing. Me and, me and Bart, we just argue where, it was either September 2009 or September 2010, we and Bart were sitting at the corridor of a very similar conference and brainstorming as to how can we get wind information to go with Martin's amazing goal navigation simulation and we came up with an ugly looking version of this data which we showed to everyone and all the scientists in the room saw it kind of repeating two three times and then stood up and clapped and this was like whoa you can do that and at that moment i was like okay i need to make this big this this everybody needs that and nasa were very kind and they they picked up on the idea that this is a way to bring a whole community of people that otherwise are barred from NASA data, not because it's not there, but because it's there in the most annoying and inconvenient way. <laughs> and this is the way to hook them up because they need this data. They want to know the wind and the temperature and NDVI and ocean currents and sea surface temperature and population density and city lights and everything that NASA <coughs> measures all the time but just don't wrap it easy enough for everyone to use. So most of you are tracking animals. If any of you have a data of a track, a track is a very rudimentary list of coordinates that's varying in time. That was the very engineering way of saying it, but if you know where someone has been more than once, you have a track. And if you have a track, I urge you to go to MoveBank and put it up there. Why? Because it's easy. Everyone has their own little track application, but MoveBank's kind of been there. They play, they have a map, they let you. We build more tools. So there's editing tools. You can make things colorful, just the track, just the point, just the individual. You can break it up to different movement types, habitat migration. You can keep it all totally secret. Only you will know it in the world, or you can open it to the world. And it's another thing that I, I will use this platform to promote. I know it's the gut instinct of everyone that spends days in mosquito infested place and chase birds in the sun and in the eyes to hoard this data because it's so hard to get. But I've, as a meteorologist, I've actually, our community is going through the same challenges. It is really hard to build a meteorological station anywhere. But only when you start sharing the data, you can turn anecdotal point observation and very small samples to something global and everybody kind of chip in. This is scientific crowdsourcing. And when you, you put up your vulture data, you will be shocked to discover how many people around the earth have other raptor data and you can very easily generate this amazing raptor study with common conclusions or contrast between different types and expand the scope of at which you can do research from a few birds, which is what's reasonable to expect from a single study group to be able to track, buy the tags, catch the birds, retrieve the data successfully to a very large and collaborative global scale. And again, it's among you to talk about not stealing each other's data and stuff. I think we're a small enough community that it's really hard to steal. If, you, if I steal somebody's data, we all know, and, and it's more or less the last time I've stole anybody's data ever. So it seems hard, but try to share, you like it. I've been having many papers by sharing. It's, it's only, it's gonna make things better. So what, the next concept that 
I want to name is the track annotation. So we all agree what's a track. That's easy. What's a track annotation? The term comes from web browsing. When you browse on the web, if you go to Google and find the site and then click the site in Google, go to another site, Google is annotating your track. Every site that you visit has your track. They know where site you visited. And this track is annotated. Every site that you visit put other variables on, on your path. So we took this term, track annotation, from the web world and related it to animal movement. We can annotate tracks. So we, we now have the tools to not only know where the animal has been, but what was there, what was where it came from, what was happening around the bird, what was the environment that the bird or animal or whale or anything that moved experienced while moving. So if you go and interpolate whatever field of environmental conditions that you have in space and time to the location, to the coordinate of your observed movement, you are doing annotation. And now we have automated annotation tools in movement. And annotation can be <laughs> static, so it can be a 2D, what kind of place it is, so it can be dynamic of what was happening at that moment, what was the animal experiencing. Now, ENV data is the acronym of Environmental Data Automated Track Annotation System. It's part of MoveBank. If you put your data up in MoveBank, <coughs> ENV data is available to you. We are working on tools that will make ENV data available to you through R, so you don't even need to put, go to ENV data to, to MoveBank to do it. The reason is we don't want you to start uploading virtual, not existing tracks just to get the environmental data. <laughs> so we need to give you a back door to do that. But if you have your, your track data in MoveMac, you can then go to the data, to the env data GUI, click a button, get a big folder, different types of data, and we try to classify it in different approaches. So if you know the satellite that collected the data, you'll have an easy time finding it. Or if you know what kind of data you're looking for, ocean, vegetation, wind, you'll find it. And we access about 15 very large data sets, which includes around 4,500 different variables. These are the European weather system, the American weather system, so ECMWF, if you know it by the acronym, and NCEP. And each of them has different data sets at different resolutions, and we access them all. We have all of NASA's products, so everything that MODIS produces, some very high resolution topography, other human, ge human geography products from the University of Columbia. Now we don't make up the data, we're not responsible for what it shows. I know 70 kilometers the crap resolution, that's what they give. We by design put only global data sets because there is no end to regional data sets and when we start putting them in, we don't end up disappointing everyone else that will want their local data set inside. So we're doing global. You can do the same research approach by yourself with a regional data set. The point here is to make data easily accessed. So if you can do it yourself, go ahead. <laughs> so now we have annotated track. We have this amazing 4D, 3D, horizontal, vertical, and in time, huge data block of environmental data, it's really 5D because there's an additional dimension of variables. You can stack up 4,000 different variables of the environment. It's not trivial what to do with this kind of, of data. It's kind of, it's new that it's available on such a large scale that it's, it's not percolated yet the regular way of looking at movement. People are got used to looking at the movement itself and trying to infer as much as they can from the way the animal is turning, is from the area where the animal has been, but not from really merging in 5D where the animal is, when it is, and what's happening there at the same time. So we are working on data analysis approaches that will help you maximize the information, environmental data. And I want to show some kind of very basic first order complication approaches. The first one, which I like to call the road not taken, is basically resource utilization function. You can generate a background area. If you know the entire home range, you can look at the conditions everywhere, the home range at all time, and make a distribution of that. For example, here you see the distribution of ocean productivity around the Galapagos Islands. Doesn't mean anything by itself, that's what it is. Now here you see the distribution of 
of ocean productivity near the Peruvian coast. They look kind of similar, but this tale of extraordinarily high productivity is very rare, but is not existing around the Galapagos. And that little tale here is basically the reason why nesting albatrosses, even though they have eggs or chicks in the nest, they need to leave the nest for two, three days, fly hundreds of kilometers, go to the coast, eat, 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 and come back. It's a very long trip, but they need to do it because only here there's enough food at high density. And even though the Galapagos are famous for being such a productive place, it does not compete with the Peruvian coast. Now, how do we know that that's what they're really up to? This is the availability of resources. This is, here you look again at the distribution of the same resource along the annotated data. So this is along a framework that you generate, and again, we need to work as a community on smart statistical models of what makes sense as a potential area. Obviously, albatrosses don't go under the ocean, they don't climb mountains, they, the things that albatrosses don't do, they don't eat at night, so there's basic <coughs> commonsensical things that we can do to rule out conditions which sh they should not bias our distribution. But we take that as the available resource, and then we look at this as what did the albatross experience. So you see that around the Galapagos, the albatross experience more or less whatever there is to experience around the Galapagos. They don't do anything special. They fly around with regard to ocean productivity. They feed the chicks. They do a lot of other stuff. But as far as ocean productivity is concerned, albatrosses experience it at, run at random. Whereas when they fly to the Peruvian coast, this very rare little tail is really where they hang around. So they really know how to find it. They go about and visit the exact same location. Though it's a rare, those, these are rare locations, they visit the exact same locations where it's high at a much higher frequency. So they know that they target that. So that's one way that you can look at your, <coughs> at your environmental data. And you can add more variable, take that to the nth dimension, make it very complicated very quickly. And I'm sure some computer scientists will catch up on that and start making complicated parallel computing tools that can calculate all of that for us. Another approach, and again, this is the simplest way of doing it, is come up with a model. A model is a mathematical formulation that expresses our idea of mechanistically what is happening. So here we think that the tailwind is pushing the ducks as they fly. We think that it's linear. Basically, there is some drag on the duck, but the duck movement speed is proportional to the wind speed. And that's basically a super simple linear model of the duck movement speed as a function of the tailwind. And though it's shockingly simple, you, if you are over the ocean, there's a very, very tight correlation. And, this, and I think the I square here is about 0.8 something, which I'm sure all of you have looked at data from the wild and getting an ask of anywhere above two is like amazing discovery. <laughs> wow, I've proved something. The funny thing with the ducks is as soon as they hit land, this whole correlation completely disappears, <laughs> which means that either they have, they're doing totally different things with regards to how they fly or how they utilize wind as they fly over land, or that over land our assumed wind data is totally crap. And I think both are true. <laughs> So here, we, I took the same approach. I went a little bit more complicated. We don't have to build a single variable linear model. We can go very, very complicated. So I made a little individual base model. I make a zebra start at the point which is the centroid of the home range where the zebra start. They migrate from the Okavango Delta to the Mahadi Hadi Pen. Mahadi Hadi Pen is a desert salt pen. There is nothing there, absolutely nothing. No face of the moon. For about two, three weeks after the rain, at the edge of the salt pan, a lot of grass sprouts up. Because there's nothing there, nobody eats it, and it's fresh grass, and it's just what zebras like. So they go from the Okavango Delta, 300 kilometers to that grass, to that salt pan, to eat that grass. The trick is getting there just the right time. If they get a week early, they have to stand a week in a salt pan without a drop of water, without a drop of food, and wait, which is not very realistic. If they come too late, the grass doesn't survive very long. And to be very annoying, there's nothing in between. So there's hardly any water between the Okavango Delta 
and the Mahadi Hadi pen. There was a fence around the Okavango Delta forever. So the zebras were living there happily year round. It kept the animals where the tourists can see them. It kept the animals out where the people want to graze their cattle. Recently, the Botswana government figured out they make more, more money on tourism than on cattle ranching and they removed the fence so they can have more animals. The zebras immediately, the next year, started migrating back to the salt patch. And that's a super amazing thing that I cannot explain how they know there's been at least three generations of zebras separated by the fence. So it's not something they heard from their mothers around the water hole or something. <laughs> Somehow they know. And the question there was, how do they know when to go? Because it's a very tricky, you need to be there just the right time. And how do they choose how fast to go? So it's, it's about 250, 300 kilometers. They don't want to run too fast. They don't want to walk too slow. So I start with a little cursor, a virtual zebra on one pixel of my computer. And if I tell that pixel that the speed is a function of some parameters times NDVI and the direction, so if you go there or turn back, is some parameters times a, a precipitation. And there is also a start walking condition, which is triggered when accumulative precipitation is above a threshold of Y. And I can run it millions of times, figure out what's the best A, B, and Y to actually make this, pic this cursor behave like a zebra. And then I can try another model. Maybe it's not NDVI. Maybe it's the derivative of NDVI. It's very popular now, surfing the green wave. So the zebras are surfing the green wave, staying at the edge of the fresh grass. It will not be NDVI itself, but the rate of change of NDVI. And I can make another model, optimize that as well. And I can compete those models and see which model gives me a better fit. And the model that is better fit probably is closer to the physical reality that controls and affects the zebra movement. And these zebras, we managed to get to a model with an R square of 0 0.94, which is shockingly and unrealistically fantastic. I'm still looking for the bug of how it happened, but <laughs> they care about not rate of change of NDVI, they don't really serve the green wave, they use NDVI of a Q to choose how fast they go, and they wait for a certain <coughs> threshold precipitation, then they leave and they walk fast if it's, they walk fast if it's green, because they know it's probably green there, and they slow down if it's raining, because you can wait longer, the rain will, the grass will last there to a later time. Now another thing that now that we pull all the data to the same spot, we can bring the added advantage of creating data that wasn't there before. So we can mix high resolution topography with ECM, NASA derived high resolution topography with European ECMWF weather prediction and calculate orographic uplift, which is how much vertical wind you get when the horizon, when the horizontal wind hits the mountains. And NASA collaborating with the European Weather Service is never going to happen, so we can put those things together in a way that wasn't easy before. We can calculate an indication of thermal uplift from the field of temperature and, and humidity and, again, topography and land surface. And doing now I'm finally segueing to the topic of this talk. <laughs> I'm, I'm abusing my role as the organizer of the conference here which are turkey vultures. <laughs> so again, this is back to what started. This is before end data existed, but starting to work on the tools that made end data happen. We're comparing turkey vultures and golden eagles, two population, uh, Great Plains of America and the East Coast. And so I don't need to explain the approach. You understand availability and utilization. Availability is red, utilization is black. You see that turkey vultures absolutely don't care about orographic uplift. They'll take it if it's there. They don't take it if it's not there. They really go with thermal uplift. They find the very high thermal uplift even when it's not so available. So they go to dead places where you can find good, strong thermals. They absolutely avoid the conditions where it's negative, where it's snowy over high mountains. Whereas golden eagles, they don't care about thermal uplift. They will use it if it's there. They are not very good at specifically seeking it out. However, they are very good at specifically seeking out this elusive tail of the very strong orographic uplift. So we, from this we learn that turkey vultures like are really dependent on thermal uplift and don't seek other modes of 
motion. And now we can go global. And again, an advantage of a system like MoveBank, you put all the data there, collect data, different populations, different studies. So we reached some critical mass of more than 50 birds, two continents, four different populations of the same species. This is a larger you can go in, in movement studies of, of tracks. We all know the efforts involved with tracking any single animal. We have these four, three North American population, one South American population. They migrate to the tropics and then return. We call the movement to the tropic outward migration and then the return migration. We, we start by calling it southern and northern, but that's kind of Eurocentral because this, these birds go the opposite way. So it's outer and return. And again, uplift, if, if the thermal uplift is low, they, they see, they don't move. So you can see where they stand, and they stand. When there's no uplift, they stand. They don't move. When there is strong uplift, this is when they move. So this is the distribution of uplift when they move. This is the distribution of uplift when they don't move. Again, striking difference. And remember, the, the fun part of this is that uplift is not something that you can easily find anywhere. So you need first to go to a weather database, then to go to a topography database, combine the two, and then you get uplift, but we give it to you. There's a button for uplift. <laughs> <laughs> Again, following the same approach, but here we analyze the movement speed, so not the, not the move go, but how fast they go, and we see that when temperature is high, they move fast, when uplift is strong, they move fast, and when the tailwind is strong, they move fast, and this is all true in the outward migration. Return migration, they seem to not care about anything, which is almost kind of lazy flying. We are not trying to optimize anything. And Keith knows some. Keith has some ideas of why they behave like that, as unreasonable as it may seem. You would but expect the opposite, right? They yeah. hurry up for the breeding. <laughs> Nothing I can. <laughs> I only know the data. <laughs> I, never, I never even touched the bridge. <laughs> now taking it to a grander scale, so now we are, we, we zoom out from the track. So this is not annotated data anymore, but we identify the home range of the turkey. So we combine all the movement to a more classically defined home range. And now we annotate the home range. So this is more of a classic habitat use analysis. And, but we are looking at the size of the home range during the breeding ground. So how large is the breeding ground? When the bird is nesting and has to feed his chick, what's the area over which is moving around, bringing food to the chicks? And we found that when the temperature is high, they're moving over larger distances and covering larger area, which makes sense. It's just easier for them. There's more uplift. They can do it for free. Why not go far? When NDVI is high, they actually go less. And our interpretation is they don't need to go far. The high NDVI means a lot of vegetation, high productivity, good yield. There's going to be a lot of animals eating those vegetation. And then the foliages don't need to cover a huge area to find those dead animals. They just have them right there. So they go as far as they need and as easy as they can do it. That's what you learn from that. This is getting the classical R square that you would expect from real nature data. All the fantastic stuff about this. And my conclusions are more or less, it's complicated. These were very simplistic, kind of single variable stuff. We still need to make a good kind of individual based cursor model for turkey vultures, work on the details of habitat. There are orders of magnitudes of difference in habitat size, in, in breeding ground size between individuals, between populations, between years. And we don't really know the good reason why that is. But there's a lot of data out there, both movement-wise and environmental-wise, and we can bring all of these things together to study it. And that's it. Thank you.